Well, it's Thursday, the 30th day of November 2017. Uh, good morning once again and welcome to Citizen Extra. My name is Wahiga Mwaura. We have a lot lined up for you today. A lot of live events happening in the city across the country. We'll be giving you updates as and when we get them. And of course, feel free to interact with us for the next three hours or so. We'll be giving you the latest in current affairs, politics, business, and even a bit of sports. And of course, uh, the latest from digital media. Uh, and we value your feedback. Talk to us. 22422 is our SMS line. And use the hashtag Citizen Extra. And I'll be reading your SMSs and your tweets throughout the course of the show. Now, yesterday, to our Weza Kenya launched a report that some are calling shocking when it comes to Kenya schools. This was a study they carried out in 2016. It was conducted in 200 primary schools in 10 districts and the results are rather worrying. My guest in studio will help us to unpack some of those numbers. How was this study carried out? What do the results say about the level of education in our country? Bearing in mind when a student is in class 2, 3, 4, that is the foundation level when you can really impact knowledge upon them that will help them to you know, achieve their dreams in life. And if things go wrong at that level, then you know, you'll have a problem moving forward. Forward. And so that's a discussion that you need to stay tuned to. Are you interested in matters education? Let us know your thoughts and uh, I'll pose uh, your questions to my guests here in studio. We're also uh, keeping our eyes focused at the city mortuary where we know that 10 families whose kin were shot dead during Raila Odinga's return uh, from a 10-day trip to the United States collected the bodies of their family members uh, at that location. We saw earlier on a section of the NASA leadership including a Nairobi woman rep Esther Pasaris, they were there to see the families off as they prepare to travel for burial. And just to give you a bit of history and context, uh, NASA had, in t had stated that they, uh, would, this process was to happen on Tuesday where they were to collect uh, the bodies of those who passed on uh, and head over to the Jacaranda grounds for a prayer memorial. But the, the police sealed off the mortuary. That did not happen. And so this is what's happening today. So the images that we're bringing to you happened a few, uh, about earlier today, earlier this morning, uh, when the family members were able to collect uh, those bodies and basically prepare to travel for burial in different parts of the country. So let's just uh, show you a little bit about what happened earlier on. And as I mentioned, NASA leadership was represented there. Nairobi woman rep Esther Pasaris, among others, were present as that was happening. All right, we're also monitoring the situation in different parts of the country. Shortly, we'll be taking you to Thika, where three men suspected to be behind the theft of 50 million Kenya shillings from the Thika KCB branch a fortnight ago are back at the law courts today. Now, of course, this is what the court will need to decide. They will decide whether these suspects can be released on bail or whether they should continue to be held as the case progresses. Uh, let's now get an update from Hassan Mugambi. Hassan, good morning. Uh, I know you are at the Thika Law Courts. A fascinating story, Hassan, for all intents and purposes. One that continues to intrigue the nation. How do we expect the prosecutor and the defense team to argue today? Uh, let us know, you know, the latest. Well, a very good morning to you to Higa back in studio here at the courtroom number one of the thicker law courts we're expecting today the prosecution side and the defense of the trio uh, to you know uh, get battling out the reasons as to why each wants uh, the ruling to be made in their favor remember the prosecution is saying that uh, the uh, trio is uh, first of all a flight risk because uh, the full amount that was uh, said to have been stolen uh, from the thicker uh, uh, KCB branch has not been recovered only uh, 20 million was recovered 30 more has uh, not yet been recovered out of the 50 that was um, uh, stolen so the prosecution uh, has it that it, uh, they are a flight risk so they could uh, just get away and never show face in the uh, courts as the case progresses and on the other side uh, the defense team uh, is stating that uh, they are not a flight risk they did not put up a fight for example when they were uh, being arrested so they should be given uh, the right to bail and um, you know to the right to fair hearing as uh, the stipulated in the constitution and also the penal code as uh, is uh, as uh, that particular thing is happening but all in all the trio of um, uh, two brothers, uh, Hal Halford Murakaru and uh, Julius Murakaru, will be presented here before uh, Principal Magistrate, uh, who is Teresa Murigi, who will be delivering that all-important ruling uh, together with the co-accused, who is also known as uh, Charles uh, 
uh, Wainaina who will be uh, presented here today and they will be uh, knowing their fate on whether or not they will be released on bail as the case progresses or uh, they will be uh, uh, continue to be detained as the case progresses. Also, uh, the investigators have cast their net wide saying that uh, the the three could not be the only suspects because of the amount of work that was done in that particular 38 meter tunnel uh, running from this toll all the way to the strong room of the bank it could not have been humanly possible to be conducted by only three people so it's a whole drug net that is supposed to be nabbed and um, the investigators are continuing with the investigation to just uh, get to see whether they will bring to book all the suspects that uh, took part in that very dramatic uh, you know uh, robbery that got tongues wagging and jaws dropping uh, across the country wahiga jaws dropping hassan mogambi i could not have put it any better myself what more can you tell us about these three suspects of course they are innocent until proven guilty but nevertheless i'm sure some history about them is coming up um, we know a little bit what more can you tell us about them well, the more that can be said about them is that they are uh, they, they are of an intellect that cannot be underestimated. A students in their KCSE and engineering uh, graduates on in the university. The two brothers, one from the University of Nairobi Electrical Engineering, one from uh, the JQuad University Agricultural Engineering, and the other one who is also from JQuad Electrical Engineering. And the intellect cannot uh, be uh, underestimated, and the detectives have it that uh, they actually actually got to use uh, what they learned in school to execute that uh, uh, particular robbery that was uh, conducted a fortnight ago on the KCB Thicker branch. That is according to uh, the uh, you know investigators handling this particular case. Also we saw um, in a section of the media yesterday uh, the parents of uh, the boys just uh, getting to uh, rant out saying that uh, more uh, needs to be done in as far as uh, you know nabbing being the uh, real suspects behind uh, humongous uh, thefts that have been uh, done uh, or rather conducted in the country because uh, there's is uh, th these are suspects that have been uh, nabbed and it is not clear whether indeed they are the ones who uh, uh, you know committed the robbery but then again they were saying that there are people in the past influential powerful people who have stolen more money than the 50 million that was um, uh, the the robbers made away with in the the KCB and are walking scot free. So uh, they, they were just trying to say justice for all is supposed to be meted out, not just for a selected few. Hassan, we know that 17 million has been recovered by the police in various currencies. The remaining 33 million, any indication from the police that they are close to recovering it, that they know where it is? What are you hearing? <coughs> So far, they are still exploring, uh, you know, uh, leads up to and including uh, the inside job that is has been uh, talked uh, widely talked about in as far as uh, the robbery is concerned. So we are yet to know or what yet to get from the detectives handling the matter whether indeed they have made any uh, close leads that would uh, lead them to uh, the rest of the 30 million or so that is yet to be recovered. Remember the th 17 million, seven, um, uh, 17 million. 17.3 million was recovered in um, uh, Kenyan currency and uh, 2.7 million uh, in uh, foreign currency and other uh, you know uh, other currencies foreign currencies from USDs to uh, Tanzanian shillings to US, uh, South African rands and Canadian dollars as well so whether or not they have made any leads to uh, you know get there it is uh, something that we are yet to establish but then again they were saying that they have made a very very positive progress in as far as recovery of the rest of the money is concerned that is according to the detectives handling the matter Ali Hassan um, at, the, at those courts there what sort of attention is this case getting talk to us about members of the press the public are they lining up to see uh, these three suspects to hear more about this case just paint for us a picture for those of us who are not able to be there as this case continues 
Well, it's quite early to tell that uh, particular uh, uh, the statement whether indeed it will attract a lot of attention as it did last time. Remember last time when we were here, members of the media were here, members of the public wanted to put, uh, you know, uh, faces to the names that they have had uh, widely uh, being behind the most dramatic, uh, you know, robbery in the country. But then again, today is uh, a bit early to say, but then again, it also has attracted uh, a very considerable amount of crowds here and we, we have seen some interested parties just making their way and asking whether indeed uh, this is the courtroom that uh, the matter will be presented and yes it will it is expected to attract quite some attention as it did last time uh, it was being heard that was on monday Thank you so much, Hassan Mogami, just for giving us a lot of details to help us understand exactly what is happening there and the latest so far. Uh, when that case starts, we'll come back to you at least to get more updates. Uh, Hassan Mogambi reporting live from uh, Thika, just outside the one of the courtrooms at the Thika uh, Law Courts. Uh, we also know that a bit later on today, this uh, Cabinet Secretary for Education, Dr. Fred Matiangi, will officiate at a stakeholders conference. Uh, the Kenya National uh, Qualifications Authority draft regulations at the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development. That function was supposed to start at 9 o'clock. And as soon as it kicks off, then we will uh, be crossing over there just to get an update. Uh, in addition to that, we're also going to Kisumu County, where Lord Otino will be giving us an update as well. But for now, as we wait to cross over, uh, let's let me introduce my guest here in studio. Uh, let me start from the uh, far right there. I'm joined by Brezhnev Otieno. I hope I've said that correct. Yes. Advocacy manager to Aweza. Welcome to uh, Citizen Extra. Thank you. Great. And right next to him, Daniel Wesonga, chair Elimu Yetu Coalition. Welcome to the program as well. Thank you, Aiga. Uh, let me start with you, Brezhnev. And uh, you shared a report which you 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 told me that. You've been releasing it over the last couple of months, but yesterday you were in Wasing issue where you were able to reveal a bit more about that. This report raising some questions about the ability to write and you know do division for, for students of class five and six in both public and private schools. Talk, talk to us a little bit about the genesis of all this. How did you carry out that study for Kenyans to understand before we show them what the study actually revealed? Uh, thanks a lot, Oegua, for having me in the studio. The first thing is that this is the first report was released in Wasangishu yesterday. Okay. But we have been doing assessments since 20, 2009 in different districts. At, at the count in 20, 2015, it was 158. So what happened as from 2009, basically we go to all the districts. Okay. We sample schools and then we assess children between 5 and 16 years, numeracy, then of course literacy. That was in both Kiswahili and, and English. Unlike the previous assessment, the Beyond Basics basically looked at only Swahili, sorry, English and mathematics only, and you are focusing on certain competencies. First of all, for English, is around spelling, it's around vocabulary, mm -hmm. writing, reading, and even comprehension. But then for mathematics, is around knowing numbers, basically around addition, subtraction, multiplication, and then lastly, around real life mathematics. Okay. Uh, in a nutshell, I, I will surely be showing you know, member, those who are watching us the graphics for them to just fully understand the findings of the report. But basically, what did you find out from what you've been looking at from 2009 till today? I think generally, I think uh, learning outcomes are static over the years. They've been very low, particularly in public schools when compared to private schools, they've not been very, very good. Are you concerned by the ability of uh, Kenyan children to not write well, although there's a, you know, we could argue about what is the definition of writing well. One person's well-written statement is very different from another's. Are you concerned by the fact that while addition and, and uh, subtraction was okay for most students that you talk to, division is a challenge? I think that the challenge is that they're not able to do those more complex mathematics. For addition and subtraction, it's very easy. But when you come to complex mathematics like addition, I mean multiplication and division, it's a challenge to them. Possibly it's the method of teaching for these children and the method of assessment by the teachers <coughs> in the school. Okay, I'll be, I'll be coming to you to get more on that. Let me now bring in uh, Daniel Wesonga just to get your reaction. You actually have a copy of the report right there with you. What have you been able to glean just from glancing at it? Mm, thank you very much. Uh, lucky enough, I've been involved in assessments uh, ways of from 2009 and we've been involved in other assessments including EGRA and EGMA uh, which are done by RTI to SOME, they are those done by Education Development Trust. And now assessments are increasingly being recognized in this country 
as a way of getting to know uh, after our children go to school, are they getting the competencies? So there are those who are giving evidence and leave it there, like Weso. Uh, so Weso will provide us with the data, and then citizen agency is built, and as citizens we can take up okay. action and okay. work on it. There are others who are using uh, the approach as a way of running the project. So if you look at Tusome, which is a national project program uh, from in all grade one and grade two, and the government supported uh, GPE, Global Partnership for Education, uh, the math, the, those, those will be in all schools. And the essence for them is uh, as, as they implement the project, in build there is assessment to know at what level a child is. So, so uh, in terms, coming back to your real question, yes, what I, I, what I gather from these findings are that uh, there is some progress in learning, but not at the desirable level. Not at the desirable not level. Not at the desirable level. level. Were you, okay, okay, I'll, I'll come back to you just to follow up on that. And coincidentally, as we get into this topic, C.S. Matiangi has now arrived at the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development. Uh, the, uh, they have now all been called to order, so you can see that they're just about to kick off. And when he makes uh, his statement, uh, then we'll be able to bring you those live images. Of course, the discussion here at the Kenya National Qualifications Authority, draft regulations, and uh, this function, of course, are starting a bit later on than we had expected, uh, but nevertheless, I'm sure part of you know, what, what they will be sharing there is something that we can also be able to, talk, to take a look at because today, in totality, we're looking at the quality of education in our country, what needs to be improved, what have we done right as a nation, and where do we need to you know, improve moving forward. I will you know, be curious to get your thoughts on uh, the change in the curriculum, the discussions around that, and, and also the rate at which uh, we now see NEC um, you know, churning out exam results and, 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 the, and the changes in that as well in, in just a bit. Okay, okay. So we, we will actually be going back there in just a bit. And Karen, but let, let's, let's continue taking a look at some of the data shared in this report. I don't know if the graphics are ready. If not, uh, we'll carry on uh, and I will be showing you those in just a bit. Let's take a look at some of the facts that came out of that particular report. Pupils in private schools had significantly better learning outcomes than their peers in public schools for all English and mathematical competencies tested. Is that a surprise? Should 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 let let's start from there. Was you know, you know, from your perspective. I think that's not a surprise. Like when you look at the private schools, the teacher people ratio is very good. Inputs are many there. I mean, they do get inputs a lot. But then, of course, look at the kind of investments parents put in terms of ensuring that their pupils get quality education. That was surprising. That, that doesn't strike you at all. Doesn't strike. We, we saw CS Matiangi, nevertheless, quite happy that uh, public schools are now performing better so at least we can say that something is being done but nevertheless when you talk about 82 percent of private school students had mastered class four level spelling as compared to 47 percent of public school students that still says that we don't we should not really be celebrating and uh, wasonga what, what do you think yeah okay uh, the, or you, or you, you, you indicate whether the findings on public private performance uh, is surprising for me it is surprising mm -hmm. if you look at the basis. Uh, the same study indicates that um, all the schools, whether public or private, had all their teachers trained. And all those teachers had at least uh, a, cert a certificate in professionally recognized teacher training. And all those teachers had um, at least five years experience and m most of the facilities uh, if you look at the school environment seem to compare but like what Bresnev indicated you, you've gleaned that from yes, the report yes they what Bresnev in indicates you find uh, the private schools will have smaller classes uh, I'm not sure about the level and input of supervision and management mm -hmm. If you go to uh, absenteeism, the pupil absenteeism levels in the, from this report for the private schools were slightly higher. That's also surprising. But if you look at the overall pupil 
absenteeism for girls and boys, uh, they are not so much different. For teachers, you find that in public, uh, the public schools and the, the private schools, about nine in ten were present, which means about ten were absent on the day this study was carried out. So, so, so then you you start getting. So, where where the variables are the same, teacher qualification, teacher experience, and uh, where the, where the variables now differ, you look at the uh, class sizes. That might be that part might of the contributing factor. So, so if, there if might be other, underlying factors. Yes. If all other factors are constant. Yes. The class size might that might be it i don't know do you want to respond it is a factor because when you have a smaller class the teacher has more opportunity and time to individually know his or her pupils can simply know the weak ones and put extra effort basically to improve on their understanding and their skills in a particular subject mm. but some of us also think uh, from our civil society perspective sometimes the person in the private uh, sector and classroom has faster space to make some decisions for, no for example if i was going to Let's go ahead if i was going to do, do, do things differently in a private school uh, perhaps the manager is there and the decisions are made within the school if we were to make a decision on changing perhaps even an approach to teaching if i'm a private a public school teacher then I might have to go through the head teacher, go through the sub county director, go through the CD, get to the ministry. The the policies are made. So 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 on. Then it sounds in terms of tedious room, already. room for for uptake of uh, decisions and, and change and local solutions, you will find maybe the if I get a teacher absent in the private school, most likely that teacher will not be paid the salary. If I get a teacher absent in the public school. The process is much longer. So, 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 for me, there are many variables at play, and and if we are saying that, if you look at the level of investment, the amount of money we pay in as taxpayers through the uh, free primary education captation and the fees that they pay through direct fees, they are about the same, and the teachers are the same. So, so what we are saying that uh, we 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 have opportunities within the public spaces, and I want to believe that. If we exploit the opportunities in the public spaces, mm. the tables will be turned. The tables will be turned. Okay, I'll, I'll come back and get a re reaction from you, Brezhnev. Um, um, we want to get your feedback on this discussion. Very important. The quality of education in our country. What are your thoughts on uh, the report that we've discussed? And I, as I mentioned, I'll shortly be showing you uh, some of the key points that came out of that report. Uh, talk to us on 22422. That is our SMS line. And also on social media. And I'll read your feedback as soon as possible. But for now, let's cross over to Kisumu County to get the latest there from Laura Otieno. Laura, what's, what is happening there? Well, thank you very much, Wahege, and a very good morning to you back at the communication center. And indeed, here in Kisumu County, the town is quite quiet. However, there is uh, some sort of uh, a, a brewing tension uh, across the border towns that is at, at a place called Ochoria, where on Tuesday night, two people were report, uh, reported, reported killed uh, and, uh, and some escalating cross-border clashes that have been going on in that area. Now, Wahege, if I could uh, take you back to what happened been happening uh, across the various border towns in Mohoroni and Chemelil. We have seen uh, quite uh, some effort being put in by various stakeholders. We have seen uh, the church, we have seen various NGOs, we have seen governors who had uh, a, peace, a peace caravan sometime early, early last month. Uh, we had seen uh, security officers have uh, a meeting. So, uh, I think last week they had a meeting basically to discuss how to uh, revert conflict in that area and the way of that uh, that very day that there was a convenment of our security officers uh, there was some reports of a uh, cattle or other stock theft that very same day so maybe today we want to talk to the church to understand uh, what their input has been because earlier on we had discussed with uh, we had sat down with ADS which is a religious movement which is also affiliated with a peace program on what they are doing in those areas and joining me now is uh, Florence who is one of the coordinators, uh, could you kindly tell us what is the, is the, the role of the church in ensuring uh, the, the, the sol solution of a conflict that is deeply rooted in such uh, matters, such complex matters, which is cattle theft and uh, border, border disputes? Thank you, Laura. Uh, our role as a church is that 
people should have a dignified life. And a dignified life means they should have life in its fullness. And we base our interventions on John 10.10 10, that says that Christ came that we should have life and have life in its fullness. We have been empowering people even in the borders because that is our role as a church so that they should take of care of their livelihoods. But what we have realized is that during electioneering period like what has just transpired, what we have done, the gains we have realized with the people is watered down. So that be, has been our concern and that's why we, uh, we brought in uh, on board our peace project. This is a new project, we've been doing it for two years now. Yeah, and as a church, we believe that we need to talk to the different ethnic groups that normally have wrangles in the border and those are the Nandis and the Luos. We've had a lot of dialogue meetings with them as individuals and as communities. We've also had dialogue meetings with politicians because to some extent, when we talk to them, they tell us that it's the politicians who are fueling some of these things. So we've talked to them, we've shared with them the importance of really having that peace so that they realize their goal. Yeah, but you know also what they tell us is that without justice there can be no peace mm -hmm. yeah so, so i thank you very much uh, for for that insight and uh well we understand that there is a gentleman here who has been involved uh, quite quite actively and especially going to th those very specific areas that have been mad with controversies i mean what can you tell us what have you been seeing on the ground okay my my, my, my name is vincent alila i'm uh, the peace coordinator i'm based in kisumu and I've been working along the, the border. Uh, we've been seeing uh, a lot of uh, activities happening in the border. Uh, before election, it was relatively cool, and we could see a lot of businesses going across the border. But uh, currently, we are seeing also escalation of, of violence. Uh, it means that uh, some of the key causes of uh, p uh, conflict in the region has not been addressed to some extent. So currently, what we are doing is a lot of reconciliation activities, uh, bringing groups across the border, to help them make peace uh, because uh, without peace there is no business that is happening in the border. We've tried a lot, we've uh, reached out to the bordering community. Currently we are having uh, peace monitors across the borders who identify issues from the other side and even from this side of the, the county. Then we have a joint forum whereby we are able to dispose all this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent. Awahiga, that is uh, what has been going down. The governor himself has said that he's going to involve various stakeholders. That is the anti-stock uh, theft uh, department and other stakeholders to basically try and pacify the situation in the borders. And also maybe just away from that, the governor also is expected to be testifying in court today at the Kisumu High Court where we expect him to uh, be taking the chambers in a case filed against him. Uh, rather a case filed by uh, former Governor Jack Ranguma challenging his win. Therefore, we'll be going to the corridors of justice sometime later on and be bringing you the latest updates from that front. Wahiga. Very informative update there, Laura Otieno from Kisumu. Thank you so much for giving us that information. And from Kisumu, we straight away cross over to Nyeri County where Martin Munene is on standby. Um, okay, I'm told we don't have him on the line just yet. Uh, when we do, he's got an interesting uh, update. He'll be bringing us there. Purple tea farming. You know, waiting to see exactly uh, what details he has in regards to that. And as soon as I'm able to cross over to him, I will. And also John Wanyama in Wasingishu. If we have the graphics ready, um, can we take a look at one or two of them? Uh, they should be coming up on your screen shortly. Uh, we start with the overall competency levels in Eng English and mathematics among... Okay, so this is the, the intro actually and, and, and it's good that uh, Brezhnev you are here. In 2016, Tuaweza, with the help of partner organizations, conducted the Beyond Basics Assessment at school level through citizen volunteers. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Now, this study assessed children enrolled in classes 5 and 6 on class four level English and mathematics. I'll come to why you the scope was not, you know, into Kiswahili, for example, or, or, or other uh, subjects. Uh, we can keep just, you know, scrolling them. Now, the Beyond Basic Study assessed writing, listening, and spelling, as well as the children's ability to perform mathematical problems, including combined operations. The study also assessed the children's critical thinking skills. Uh, if we have, we, do we have them there? 
Okay, uh, we'll, we'll be putting them up shortly. So I asked a question which I guess I can ask to you now. It might seem obvious why English and math alone. We understand why English and math, but why not other subjects as well? Uh, like, like previously for the normal weight assessment, we have been doing math, English, and Kiswahili and for Kiswahili. two level. But for this one, for 2016, it was a pilot for Beyond Basics. Piloting with, with class four level mathematics and English and seeing how class five and six, and actually their skills and competencies they have for that, 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 that level of class. So it was a pilot. Okay. But I'm sure eventually, okay. maybe next year, you can see, see how we can drop in other subjects. Okay. What's like so, like Swahili. And this is something that you've discussed, I'm sure. It, it's a consideration that you've had. You've it's had a in pilot. Mind. It works so well. I think we can do more next year. Okay. You, you assume like you want to come <coughs> in. <coughs> yeah. I, I think the, the whole philosophy in most assessments, especially all grade assessment, is uh, whether people are literate or numerate. So the obvious choices usually then tend to be language, the language, and for Kenya, and then it's Kiswahili and uh, English, and then math. So if you acquire those basic numeracy competencies and literacy competencies, you can be able to read, you can be able to learn. But I think the most significantly in, uh, in Kenya, there is the language in education policy. And uh, the language in education policy is that uh, from grade one to grade three, uh, the teacher teaches uh, through using uh, mother tongue or the first language. Mm -hmm. But from grade four, English is supposed to be the, the language of carrying out all instruction. So in, in essence, then, if you are going to pick out um, the priority as over English over Kiswahili, then you will go for one that is the medium. The okay. main medium is then English. Okay. So combine with then math and you put then grade four is also a transition of curriculum from now a lower level to upper primary, which starts to pick competencies beyond uh, the, the, the basics. So you will still get uh, addition to multiplication to division. The highest in math is always division. Mm -hmm. But the, the tasks that are grade two will do in division mm. will be different from the task for grade uh, uh, four. So if then you want to see the children in upper primary or the children in, in secondary, if they are learning at their level, for primary you will pick usually grade four because that's the benchmark, the lowest skill you can pick for upper. And then if you go to secondary, you pick from one mm. and so on. And, the, so on. The, and these skills build on, on, on each other as, okay. they, as progressively children go through the learning. There's, I know you want to, re to react, but even as you do, there's an SMS that uh, I, I've lost it now, but I, I can remember a bit of what uh, someone had messaged. They said, as, you, as we were talking about public versus private schools, they said when you look at a public school that has about 100 students and a private school that has 25, this person feels that for all intents and purposes the public school has done quite well and they've actually said do not judge now talking to us here in studio i can give you a chance to respond to them i hope i can pull that sms and just read it exactly as they sent it no, uh, go ahead Brett. that may be true but we'll be shocked we have public schools which has very high enrollment of pupils maybe sitting for standard eight but they're doing better i think for me one thing is about the management in the school there's some, some head teachers who are going beyond the call of duty and ensuring that their pupils perform better exam examinations despite the high number of pupils within that school. Okay, okay. Uh, we just also want to remind you that we will continue to monitor what is happening at the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development where any minute now we expect CS Matiangi to make, uh, to give a speech there as soon as uh, that happens, as soon as we have any indication that is about to happen, then we will be taking you there. Now, fact four of this, uh, yes, and you can see that uh, that is what's happening on the other side of the screen. Uh, but just coming back to you, even as we continue to monitor what's happening at that location, uh, one of the interesting facts out of your report is that grade repetition is common. Over half of all pupils in classes five and six had repeated at least one grade. Repetition was far more common in public schools. Uh, I want to get your, your thoughts on this. That's of course worrying. Because once students start on AD1, the idea is that they should transition from one in the former system to AD8 and then transition to secondary school. Why, why do people make people to repeat? Possibly, I think, at times it's against their will of the people. Just some system within the school that makes that child to repeat without any reason. What happens when parents say, this is not what we expected from our child, they course, need to repeat? Of course, the influence from the parent is also very, very important there. It's a big, big factor. 
Okay. Because they feel the child is not doing well academically, depending on their perception. So the only remedy for them is for the, for the child to repeat. In any way, can repeating work out for good for that student? Can there be any positives out of you know making a student repeat? Maybe one out of ten. Mm -hmm. One out of ten. Yes. Yeah, actually, Masonga, you the same opinion. There is uh, the existing research evidence on learning is that um, okay, if a child is automatically promoted or if the child is made to repeat because the child's performance is low, that is not the solution. So either way, if we promote them and they are not mastering the curriculum without doing anything, we still continue having low learning levels. Mm. If we make them repeat, the evidence that is there is that it little contributes to improvement in learning, but it is a cost driver. So if you're talking about the same public schools with 100 children and another 10 repeat, you are saying that in the next class already the 10 have taken up the 10 spaces, so you have 110. And you pump in again an additional one year of resources for the 10. And without necessarily commensurate increment in learning. And then more so, the policy is very clear that um, the child should not repeat. So other arguments aside, the other policy aside. the policy in Kenya is that a child should not repeat a grade. Okay. And we we'll, we we'll, we'll leave that discussion uh, at that. And then, Still oh, okay, okay, sorry. And, and, then, and then as the Tonga says is that as you keep the child in school, more and more resources are used for this particular child mm. within the public education, primary education. So there's system. a price to pay. Yes. There's a price to pay. Even as we continue talking about public versus private schools, your take again on free day secondary education. We are talking about primary schools where public schools are lagging behind private schools and, and we have different reasons why what do we see as the effects of free day secondary education on our secondary schools if you are to do a five-year projection where are there opportunities things that you say will be a, will be good as a result of the directive by uh, the president as part of their campaign manifesto before the august state polls but also what do you see as challenges that kenyans need to take into account seriously bearing in mind almost every student that went through standard eight has been told that by Christmas Day you need to know which school you're going to. And, and let me start with you, Wesonga. Yeah, and uh, for us in uh, civil society, uh, we exist as a limiato because we push for formal education for all. Wesonga, allow me, allow me to interrupt you. Let's cross over to the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development. Okay. Yes, yeah. Matiangi is speaking. Let's listen in. Chancellors, the chair of the Kenya National Qualifications Authority, and all of you, my brothers and sisters who are here this morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, we are grateful that uh, we've come this far, and we thank God for the opportunity we've had to get this work done. Uh, PS and the team, I'm very grateful that we uh, got here in six months, and. Uh, Colleagues, we should strive to get some work done uh, in our country and in the service of our people and walk away from the very bad habits we usually have. We get a task done, then we start uh, seminars, trips, benchmarking trips. You know, we have all crazy things that happen. We waste so much time instead of getting some work done in a very straightforward manner. I had occasion to look through the draft regulations that we are looking at today, the framework and all that, and I agree with Professor Dwell that uh, we have not reached there yet, but that's why we are meeting, so that we can uh, share uh, ideas on how we can strengthen the framework that we have developed here uh, this morning. But, but let me start by saying this, and, and uh, the bit about it is that a good number of us in the room have had this experience and we've suffered uh, for quite a while. You know where I think the rain started to beat us, especially in the higher education sector in our country, is when with the massification of universities, we began admitting students and the gross abuse of the clause in most of our statutes that says you need to have a C plus or its equivalent. Now, that equivalent is not standardized. That equivalent is not known what it's supposed to be. I have been a P1 teacher for 13 years, 
So 13 years of teaching as a P1 teacher, are they equivalent to a C plus, which is the minimum qualification to go into university? Or I have been the data entry clerk at the Ministry of Agriculture for the last 20 years. So are the 20 years equivalent to the C plus that I need to be uh, an undergraduate student in the university? And then of course, the anarchy we've had before with the, the, the diploma certification in the country. If this was a church and what I'm delivering this morning would be a sermon, it would be entitled The End of Anarchy, Confusion and Mediocrity. <laughs> because what we are doing here is we are ending anarchy in the manner in which we manage the certification and qualification processes in our country. You meet seven people, each one of them holds a diploma. And they mean seven different things. One has spent three months, another one six months, another one twelve months, another one one year and a half. And when you calculate the courses they have studied, they have never been weighted by anyone. So you cannot tell whether one diploma is the same as the other one in terms of weight, relevance, and quality, as it were. Then the anarchy that sets in when it comes to admitting students to uh, the universities. Uh, my good friends, uh, there is nothing better we could have done for our education sector than get to this point of ending this anarchy. And of course, I've just been telling Professor Kerry that we need to address, let us be completely uh, exhaustive in dealing with some of these issues. I meet parents every day who tell me this. Um, my daughter or my son studied law in Australia or in the UK or in another country, in Canada, some such place. They graduated. They arrived here and applied to join the Kenya School of Law. And they were told, no, 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 no. Go to Riara University and study some 16 units you did not study so that we can actually admit you here to the School of Law so that we can prepare you then to become a lawyer. There are so many parents who are organizing out there. There are so many of our children who are frustrated because we have never told them this is what you need to go to point B, which is what any responsible society does. We should be able to tell our children uh, this you need to spend X number of years, you need to do X number of courses, and the courses should include the following. Then after those courses, you come and apply to um, the Kenya School of Law. So you have so many of our young people who are frustrated because we have not provided proper guidance to them on what needs to be done. And then, of course, the anarchy I've described, uh, you know, on criteria for admission to universities. Then the third problem that we have, um, my colleagues who are here, that they were from uh, CUE and Professor Antarangui and uh, Martin Olo and Flora Karemi, the education team from the Ministry of Education, know the challenges we face um, at Jogo House. Because we're the ones who are sued left, right and center by all manner of people. Uh, I don't know how many cases now we have. We have been sued by people who are petitioning the election of others. Or you cleared this person to run for governor when they did not have a degree. Uh, or you cleared this person to run for president when they actually did not have a degree. And in one recent case, we have been going through hell trying to establish did this person actually hold a degree, which has forced us now to write in the country where he said he studied. And that country he wrote back to us and said that institution he claims to have gone to school at the time he claims to have gone there was not a degree awarding institution. <laughs> but he, he says he holds a degree. Then he's a member of a professional body. So we write to professional bodies in Kenya. Is this good man your member? Because people don't become members of LSK, for example, unless they hold a degree in law. We, we could save ourselves all these problems by what we are doing here today. And we will insist on doing it robustly. So, we are bringing order and organization and coordination and proper management to the certification process in the country. So that as we go forward, it's clearly understood by everyone. A diploma means X. And for you to be admitted at the university, once you've been admitted at the university and you hold a diploma, therefore you qualify to be exempt uh, in this and that kind of program.
That way we are then an orderly society. Two critical issues that we have to pay attention. We must make sure that the framework we are developing, uh, Professor Kerry, we review it every four years. Because this is a very dynamic uh, terrain. Things change all the time. We have to constantly, and it means that we look for resources and support you to do much more research and engagement with others. We have to keep looking at it. It's not cast in stone so that we decide today what we are agreeing here today is what's going to hold uh, and hold all of us together for generations to come. It takes a long time, uh, you know, um, to get some things done. We should review this framework and, and, and the regulations every four years. That's one thing I propose. And I want to ask you, colleagues, that we ensure that this is done. And secondly, in working on this, I, I want to ask you, uh, Professor Kerry, that we strengthen our inter-institutional relations between the regulators uh, and the examiners. Uh, we, we should develop very, very strong relations so that as we go forward, uh, we are on the same page in terms of what you require. So that when Professor Tarangui will be looking at universities and asking whether or not they have met the qualifications in admitting their students, uh, he is aware of what the Kenya National Examinations Council has approved, is aware of what the Tiveta uh, has approved, and, and we are working in sync. Because, we, my good friend, we lose so much time because sometimes we work in silos. I mean, the other guy in the corner is doing their own thing, the other one this way is doing their own thing. And I have recently witnessed cases where we have even ourselves had to uh, uh, keep talking to regulators because ultimately the people we serve who are our children or our young people and others who are interested in education are frustrated because we are not guiding them properly. They go to the Kenya National Examinations Council, they want to get the equation. You went through an IGCSE system and you applied to join the University of Nairobi. Then they tell you, fair enough, go to NEC and let NEC certify that your scores under the IGCSC system are equivalent to what we demand to admit you. Then it takes time and sometimes you almost get an impression that it changes, you know, too often. It's not the same thing today as it was yesterday. So we, we, we need to have a certain sense of consistency and we need to institutionalize the way we do this so that we do not frustrate our people and we don't frustrate uh, parents and, and guardians as we go along. Whatever it takes, because I know and I've um, witnessed cases where um, we're arguing about this, we ourselves, when we're having this discussion in the ministry, we, we, we argue a lot about, uh, about this. Um, it's a diploma from uh, Kisumu National Polytechnic, the same as the diploma from Kenya uh, Institute of Management. Uh, do they hold the same weight? Can you therefore be admitted to the University of Nairobi uh, on the same terms if you came from Kisumu National Polytechnic uh, just as those who come from Kenya Institute of Mass Communication? That's why we're doing this. Because we want to make sure that this is harmonized and we reduce the amount of uh, pressure and stress uh, on, on, on our people. The second last thing I want to say is that we, whatever it is going to take, we must now begin to develop our qualifications databases. Uh, and I want to ask the bodies in this room that handle certification. With the new uh, National Education Information Management System, NEMIS, we have no excuse. I do not want, or I would not like to see as a responsible citizen during another election, uh, you know, court papers flying all over the place. It should be easy for Mwenda and Tarangui to go to the database and confirm that this good gentleman actually went to this school they said they went to, so they start their KCP. Uh, indeed, their information is available. They start for the KCSE, and then they were admitted at JKU. Fair enough. And when they qualified from JKU, you can trace their information, uh, as it were. Others will continue having these amusing challenges that we deal with. Because I remember during the elections in 2013, 
And it's interesting the way our court system works. I don't know whether you guys noticed this, but at least Martin Oloa and Flo and I have talked about it. A guy went to CUV and was cleared to run for governor. He presented a certificate from Costa Rica. It was written in some sort of language that no one could interpret at that time. And because it was taking time to interpret the language of that certificate, he convinced everyone he, he held a degree. So he was cleared to run for governor. When the interpretation was done, it turned out actually that that was a participation certificate from <laughs> an evangelistic campaign. <laughs> he had attended that crusade. I'm serious, this is not fiction. He attended a crusade in some country and Professor Dole, he was given, you know, a participation certificate. Thank you for attending the crusade. <laughs> so he brought it here and threw a tantrum and so on. And then he was uh, cleared in 2013. So by the time people discovered, then went to court. And Martin can confirm that the suit was not hard and determined before the end of the term. <laughs> and the good guy is up through with a participation certificate from a crusade, I think. I don't know what happened. I, I did not follow it up. Maybe you know, I should follow up what happened. I mean, it's, it's a joke. Then one person who fortunately was not cleared by CUE arrived there, and Professor Ntarangu, you are lucky you are not arrived that time to suffer this pressure, and presented their first certificate. Their first degree certificate was a PhD. That was their first degree certificate. Their second was a bachelor's, and their third was a master's. And when people followed this up, they discovered that actually the so-called PhD, the address of the university that was given, is someone's house in Pennsylvania, in the US. Now the extent to which we go to do these silly things are amazing. But now we're ending this anarchy. That's why we are calling for a qualifications database. So the agencies that are here from January, as soon as we complete this process of the regulations and the framework and everything, as we agreed, our next port of call is to now begin to develop the databases so that it's not a problem for anyone to trace qualifications. You say, my name is John, I went to uh, Lone Tree Primary School, uh, went to Mountain something secondary, and I ended up in the Two Rivers University and your documents are there. People don't have to discover that the so-called Two Rivers University is actually someone's house. Uh, you know, in Busia or some such place. So, 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 so that we are decent society as we, as we move forward. To be honest with you, in conclusion, I'm really grateful and I want to thank you, P.S. Muinsi uh, and the colleagues from the Kenya National Qualifications Authority, Professor Kere. I know at some point we have uh, driven you through intense pressure and we have been too demanding of you. But I am really grateful and I thank God that we've come to this point. It's a first one for our country, it's very important for our sector, and it's a first signature uh, and uh, reform for how we are going to move forward with middle-level training as we uh, go forward as a country. It's good for all of us. And if we work together this way and make sure everyone is around the table, we will strengthen this sector. And then, of course, save our young people and our parents and all the players in the sector. The agony of always guessing what needs to happen where. And I am looking forward, by the grace of God, and all of us should, as people interested in this sector, to um, a vibrant growth, better guidance. And once again, I assure you of the government's commitment. When the president talks about um, institutionalized and deepened reforms in the education sector, this is what President Kenyatta wants. This is what he means. That it will be an education sector that is organized. That 
the many young people we are driving through middle level colleges and training are not going to be confused because we are reforming a curriculum that respects pathways and we want our young people whichever pathways they choose they can go to the farthest that the Lord will enable them to go in acquisition of knowledge they can go to degree programs they can have two or three degree program uh, 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 certificates as it were the pathways will be defined and it will not have any confusion as we go forward so we we assure you of our consistent support and since this is a noble work that we are doing I pray that we continue to work together to do this and it's an achievement that we all will be proud of I wish you all the best as we have this discussion today I look forward to the report that comes out of here and PS means as you know uh, let's get some work done uh, our colleagues who are working on NEMIS with the support of the World Bank are we in, fortunately Dr. Jenny Munga is here we will weigh in that NEMIS now begins to uh, take on board this as a critical aspect of what we are going to do. And I would like uh, 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 Jen to have NEMIS team meet with Prof. Sakere and PS Munsi so that we can see how we can tap into the resources available by NEMIS to assist the institutions that are here to create the qualifications database because that is the way we have to go uh, uh, to support this sector. Thank you so much and have a blessed day. Thank you. Yes, Dr.